Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third lecture on Collider BSM searches. Okay. I hope you are all excited that we discovered Higgs boson yesterday. <laughs> yes. right. You understand how we did that, right? And uh, today is actually the, uh, there's an organized event to, to celebrate uh, the Higgs boson 10 year anniversary by the US physics community. Uh, it's broadcasted online. I will send you the links uh, tomorrow so it doesn't interfere with our lecturing. <laughs> uh, you can see all the nice uh, 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 discussions about the history and also some virtual tours to CERN, et cetera. Okay. Um, but, uh, okay. I'm confused about the, the blackboards. Okay. Uh, good. So, lecture three BSM. So Higgs was BSM back then. So the fact that we were able to discover Higgs on the board uh, yesterday, you already had an experience of how we think about the BSM physics searches, right? We think when we postulate some particle, we think about uh, what's their property, right? What's the major production mode? What's the major decay mode? And how in, in a given environment, what are the background, what are the most promising channels that can go along and further try to optimize the searches? with various analysis. So in fact, in a detailed search, for instance, the Higgs 2 for leptons, uh, some student asked me later, the, carries much more information about Higgs property. It tells us about Higgs CP, tells us uh, 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 about the Higgs spin information. We learn a lot, okay? So spin correlations, angular correlation of those encodes a lot more information. Uh, one can try to extract those by exploring detailed uh, uh, properties of the, of the event. But the general idea is simple. Right? Think about something, think about how to search for them. The, we want to pick them out from the, from the background. Okay. So what I didn't emphasize yesterday due to the lack of time is, I forgot to tell you what's the major production mode of the Higgs. But I, I suppose uh, Sally Dawson have already told you about that. I hope you remember, what's the major production mode? Glue, glue fusion, right? So glue on, glue on fusion. In the beginning, we didn't, we didn't think this is a production, major production mode. In fact, the begin, when in the beginning, when we talk about Higgs boson properties, uh, you know, um, after, uh, after the, you know, uh, Peter Higgs paper and other people's, but Weinberg's paper, uh, phenomenologists start to think, they, they calculate properties thinking, oh, the production rate is too small. Maybe we can never detect this particle, okay? But through graduate effort, people realize in, in, in fact, in the beginning, such one loop calculation, uh, we made several uh, mistakes in history. But eventually, we converge and uh, find out this is the major production channel in the hadron collider environment. Okay, we produce the Higgs. Uh, there's a lot of details we can talk about this loop. Okay, there's uh, 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 low energy effective theory to derive this infinite top mass limit, but also there's light quark contributions that is non-trivial, give you precision corrections to the production rate, et cetera. Okay? Uh, but this is a major production mode, but I just want to introduce one concept that you, you might have heard about, which is called K-factor. It's a, it's a K-factor is a measure of the cross-section that let's say, next to leading order cross-section or leading order cross-section, for instance, or next to next leading uh, order cross-section compared to previous order. This is uh, just a simplified notation about what do we expect from, higher, what, from our calculation, what's the, what's the corrected rate of Higgs production. Just to give you a sense of the, the glue-glue fusion Higgs rate, okay? The glue-on-glue-on -glue -on Higgs rate Higgs rate is approximately 12.9 picobar. It's different from what I wrote you on the first lecture. I, I said Higgs production rate is 50 picobar, right? That's because 12.9 was a leading order cross section at this, from this one loop diagram. Okay? But one can, times one plus uh, 1.28. For the next leading order, plus 0 0.77 from the next to, leading, next to next leading order. This is the Higgs cross-section, roughly around 40 picobar. 
from ground fusion, uh, like uh, inclusively with also this uh, initial state radiation, etc. Okay, so just imagine, just imagine, uh, I try so hard to calculate the, this vertex correctly, and I try to calculate the Higgs rate. I predict it to be 12.9 picobar. Then I measure Higgs. Suddenly, it's the Higgs I seem to be producing too much Higgs. I will have a big access in my in, in my search channel. I will sing and dance, think about there must be some non-trivial BSM physics to it. Uh, but that's uh, uh, before you do that, you should really ask yourself: Do I know the Higgs pr the production rate of my BSM physics? Here is the Higgs, or, or not? So you should think carefully and uh, try to estimate what's the corrections on this and what the uncertainties on this. Okay. So I just want to mention for the first time here. Uh, Precision is an important ingredient in our BSM searches. Not only affecting our background estimation, but also affecting our signal estimation. We need to improve on both ends. Question. So you're saying um, get, a, get a quick estimate on it, right? Um, so in that sense, is there some kind of quick interval that you can do to get that? Uh, so Higgs, I cannot. Uh, uh, Higgs is very particular. Uh, so for, for typically, you, you would expect the next, next leading order correction from QCD, you know, alpha s over, uh, you know, 3 pi. So there's some, some typical estimate of the next leading order correction. And there's other prescriptions people have on estimating the theory errors by doing the scale variations uh, on, the, uh, on the renormalization scale choice here. That's another way to estimate errors. But Higgs is very special because, first of all, the leading production is from gluons. Okay, so the next leading order correction uh, from QCD will have a lot of color factors to worry about. There's a color factor, big factor in front. Okay, on top of that, I'm going to introduce the real emission in the next leading order correction. So that has a has a quark initial state. I have lots of quarks. In particular, I also have valence quark. So, so that's basically the next thing order correction introduce a new production mechanism for the for the Higgs boson subject to the new uh, pattern distribution functions. So all of those factors contribute to the to the big K factors here, right? You should be worried seeing number more than one from next thing order and next to next thing order. You would uh, you would want your uh, cal calculation of cross section to be converging, uh, but we really calculate Higgs to a high order. I think we, we, we are now like at NQ by LO already. And uh, we also do, uh, did a lot of other uh, important calculations, like resummation. It's like some, something I wouldn't be able to explain here right now. Go ahead. Uh, we're at LSMC and that's designed with this process in mind. Yes, yes. So um, phenomenologists has already calculated this, uh, uh, but not to the precision level we have, but the calculated to, to, uh, to the good to, to, to figure out this is a leading channel. So in, in fact, it's our serious job, not only to figure out the, the, the plausibility of the existence of such particle, but also uh, we give theory predictions of how they would appear with our basic understandings of the collider environment. If you, have all the, if you absorb all the knowledge we talked about in the previous two lectures, plus a little bit more uh, QFT calculations, you will be able to do that, okay? In fact, not only this, there's a major production mode. So phenomenologists also figure out the, the leading uh, uh, discovery channel would be that photon, okay? Uh, so both, ex both the experiment actually trying to, one of the important benchmarks when they design the detector is to optimize their photon identification and their energy resolution performance. Uh, so, so theory and the experiment work closely to each other and uh, we, we have, uh, um, uh, we work together to enable the discovery, okay? And uh, you can play important roles in the new particle discovery by thinking through all those processes, okay? So that's a quick recap of uh, the Higgs discovery. So now let's uh, step back and think about the general BSM uh, searches, okay? General. So I would like to uh, 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 sketch, uh, you know, uh, 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 some uh, uh, how we how we should think about the BSM searches by um, um, by mainly uh, uh, divide them in, uh, or classify them through their production topology. Okay, so production mechanism. 
of BSN. Okay. Uh, the simplest and leading, and the one we mo play most ways is, of course, the resonance production. Right? We have an incoming particle and two incoming particles. Okay? We try to produce a new particle, BSM, directly, and we want it to be resonant. Okay? So this is a so-called simplest topology for the BSM production, and we will come up back to those examples. Higgs was clearly already an example of that. Uh, we discovered Higgs through such properties. The, this is a production, of course, the, stable, the particle is unstable, I'll decay back to the standard model. Okay. So then we have many other uh, topologies. The next uh, very common and uh, uh, useful topology is the BSM pair production. Okay. So we are having incoming standard model particles. Give me outgoing BSM particles. Incoming standard model, outgoing BSM. This is a super typical production mechanism we often consider for many reasons. There are, we can have uh, many good approximate discrete symmetries uh, assigned to BSM particles. And so many of them have been mentioned. We can put a parity Z2 uh, for those uh, states and make the standard model even. So I have to produce those B BSM particles in pairs. right? And uh, in SUSI, we have R parity, et cetera. In, uh, we also have something called T parity uh, in little Higgs models, et cetera. So BSM pair production is a very typical thing uh, uh, when we think about the uh, uh, possible topologies uh, of uh, BSM uh, physics. They have quite a different uh, behaviors compared to the resonance production. Uh, in terms of cross-section, how it responds to different um, uh, 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 different uh, backgrounds and uh, uh, production rates. Okay. But further, we can. Uh, uh, well, but I want to mention, even for this BSM pair production, they, they can have. Uh, uh, they, there's another layer of complexity is how they decay back to standard model. We'll, we'll, I will attach the decay possibilities uh, uh, next later. Okay. So certainly. Okay. Certainly, it typically should be categorized in this uh, second the topology, but they are so special, they are so important and motivated by dark matter consideration, so we typically write it as a separate one. So uh, BSM, but this time in particular, they are invisible particles. Okay. For instance, our dark matter candidate, WIMP dark matter candidate, they, will be, they can be parity produced through the weak interaction, there's no resonance. Uh, if their mass is heavy, we're going through off-shell gauge bosons. There's no resonance uh, structure behind. We're doing invisibles here. Okay? So what can I can see in my detector? I will only be seeing nothing. So that is not an observable fine process at my collider. So what do I do? Um, I hope you all know. What do, do you know what do I do if I want to produce dark matter and detect them at the uh, hadron colliders? Looking for missing energy. Uh, that's very good. But let me, let me write the answer here and come back to it. So this missing energy has a very special symbol, like slash means missing, right? Uh, has a subscript called T. Means missing energy in the transverse plane. We'll come back to this transverse plane thing. However, here, my energy is missing in every direction. It's not in the transverse plane. There's no, there, it, there's no uh, missing energy in the transverse plane. So what we do is we attach additional particles to the initial state. So I produce uh, the dark matter uh, invisible particles in pairs and kick the system with some other, other particles radiated uh, from the ISR lag. Of course, you can do attach it from other processes, but, but typically we attach, uh, we use this uh, as schematic way to show that. So this is called mono jet. Which means at the colliders, I only see a jet plus nothing. So of course, I have missing, missing energy in the system. Okay. In fact, people uh, uh, further uh, uh, try to, uh, of course, try to uh, search for many different kinds of uh, missing energy sources. So they also search for uh, jets plus missing energy, and also mono Z, mono photon, mono W, even mono top. 
I just want to ad attach a lot of missing energy to another particle of standard model that I can reconstruct and tag. Okay. So uh, they are motivated by different level, by different BSM considerations. But basically, this class is uh, called the mono everything. Okay. Okay. So, and there's another class uh, of uh, 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 searches, uh, BSM searches, the first type. Uh, of the production mechanism is called associated production. So I can have two standard model particles. I'm writing blobs is a bit abstract, but uh, I will give you a concrete example very soon. I can produce BSM particles in association with a standard model particle, as Z, gamma, W, etc. But this the BSM particle doesn't necessarily be an invisible particle. It can be a visible particle, right? I can produce uh, two of them together, et cetera. But what's important is they're produced in association with another standard model particle. Okay? For those who are familiar with Higgs physics enough, uh, I, or if you remember Sally's lecture early, the third largest production mode for the Higgs boson is actually associated production. Okay? So I have a QQ bar initial state. I can have a Z or a W offshore. I have a Z and W in the final state plus a Higgs boson, right? So back then when Higgs was BSM, I would search for Higgs, but in association with Z and W. In fact, this is the leading channel contributes to our measurements of Higgs to bottom Yukawa. We've we find Higgs to be bar decay in this channel, not in the gluon gluon fusion channel, okay? Uh, from, you can easily guess why, because uh, just seeing two, two bottom jets in nothing else, I have a huge QCD background. This is associated production is trying to help me uh, increase my signal background ratio and en enable my uh, recent uh, discovery or measurement of the uh, uh, bottom wheel cover. Uh, okay, question. How, how do you tell like, uh, whether it's associated production or like, uh, initial state radiation? Ah, so uh, good question. I couldn't tell. But uh, so, so <laughs> uh, this is the subclass of this. Uh, it's just uh, invisible. But, but given the you know, invisible is so well motivated uh, in, whenever you think about dark sector and dark matter related stuff, uh, 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 this one, uh, had, we, we separate them. And in particular, this one I specify uh, that this is associate production with mono everything. The mono means I see those particles, but nothing else. But for those one, I see some standard model particles producing you know, association with BSM particle. This BMSM particle may decay back to standard model, so I see multiple things. It's just this particle helped me to uh, tag my event to help me increase my signal background ratio. Okay, those topologies uh, means schematic. That means mutually ex exclusive. There are regions they can overlap, etc. Okay, okay. Of course, of course, as I mentioned in the uh, lecture, uh, the previous lectures. Uh, the increasing number of final state particles with, uh, uh, you know, reduces the cross section. So, the by doing a mono jet, for instance, compared to the original BSM pair production, I'm paying a penalty in my cross section. But I have to pay the penalty in this cross section because otherwise, it's a purely missing energy. I have, I, I cannot measure it. That's unobservable. So I, I, I have to induce a mono jet here to enable observability. Okay, there. Are, there are many, like five, six, seven, you know, many different ways to, to produce uh, particles. But uh, I think our key here is to understand the basic topologies and understand their uh, properties. For more complex uh, BSM topologies, uh, uh, we can use what we learned from here uh, uh, to, to derive how we, do, how we deal with them. Okay. So, good. Um, did I design? I hope I, <laughs> hope I did it well. So now, I'm going to talk about, uh, the, the, so the plan of today's lecture, I will talk about this first and this second. But uh, uh, before I go into the you know, experimental considerations or collider considerations, I, I just want to finish uh, this part a bit more. Okay? Uh, one, two, both. So BSM particles itself, of course, okay, 
can be metastable at my colliders or can be long-lived. So this belongs to a class of particle signature called the long-lived particles. Okay. So which I mentioned yesterday, that if a particle is metastable and, uh, or long-lived, uh, they can travel a certain distance in, in my detector and decay. So I have to think about some search strategies to look for them. Okay. To look for long-lived particles, Obviously, there's a leading, leading distinction from any other standard model process. That is, this particle is long-lived, right? have displacement. So reconstruction of the displaced vertex or displaced tracks, uh, et cetera, will be a very straightforward, uh, naive uh, uh, thing we can, we, 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 we can try to carry out. But in detail, they are very complex because we didn't design detectors to look for them. We designed the detectors to look for electrons, muons, photons, uh, you know, the standard model hadrons. Uh, so in reality, we have a lot of troubles with uh, keeping data of, like, of this kind as, through the process so-called the trigger. Okay? I believe Heiser uh, mentioned this in, in, in her talk. But we'll come back to this uh, later on today if we have, if, if have some more time. Okay? So, so any BSM particle can be long-lived, and they belong to a different class of search called the long-lived particle signatures. A lot of recent activities have been focusing on it. And there's a lot of continuity discussion we can, we can have. Okay? But if they're not long-lived, they decay promptly. In fact, uh, in, for most of the uh, uh, you know, uh, models, weakly interacting models, uh, the particles will decay promptly. So the BSM particle itself will decay back to standard model. Okay, it can also decay back to standard model plus another BSM model. Uh, it it depends on re really depend on the detail of your, your model building. Okay, and uh, when it decay back to standard model, uh, it has a particular type. That is, if uh, if both of standard model particles are visible, I will try to find them and try to reconstruct them and find, uh, reconstruct the, the environment mass and find the peak here, right? Just like a Higgs. If you decay to die photon, I see the both photon, I reconstruct the environment mass and see an excess in the environment mass system. So both are visible, very good. We are looking for the excess. Okay? But there's another possibility if it's going to an invisible part. Of course, if it decay to a pair of invisible particles, our question comes back to this uh, mono-everything kind of consideration. It will reduce it back to the uh, uh, mono-everything search strategy. There is another possibility of doing being semi-invisible. BSM particle decaying back to a standard model particle plus an uh, invisible particle. Okay? So there, we want to do something else to enhance our search. In fact, uh, that's another second example I want to mention today. Uh, many of you can guess it is uh, 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 it's a precision measurement we did recently. Okay. So for the BSM pair productions, similarly, the BSM particle can come back to standard model pairs, or uh, three of them, I can try to reconstruct them. Or the BSM pairs involves uh, uh, a standard model and standard model. Okay. So visible, I can try to reconstruct, or one visible plus one invisible, which is a very common symmetrically, which is very common for SUSY inspired searches with uh, our party conserving SUSY inspired searches. Those invisible particles are often your dark matter candidate, uh, but you can have produce some SUSY supersymmetry partners in pairs, like stops, they came back to top plus, plus some dark matter candidate. Of course, this standard model particle can further decay and we can tag them, okay? But anything I label standard model, I would assume I either see them directly or I reconstruct them. I can tag those particles. So, but the, still, the pair production can do, uh, you know, mainly into reconstructable BSM particle pairs or, uh, you know, having semi-invisible ones, okay? Of, uh, of all those kinds, uh, there's a one thing you might see in many of the discussions which is another reasonable possibility that when I produce BSM particle pairs, 
they go through a long decay chain. I have many BSM particles of, uh, you know, uh, 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 there, uh, degree freedom. I produce some heavy mode. Uh, they can decay, um, uh, you know, to standard model, uh, rare decay chain, BSM1 going to BSM2, back to standard model going to BSM3, et cetera, okay? I can have symmetric or asymmetric de uh, uh, decay chains of those particles. A very rich possibilities of how my BSM would appear in the, in uh, in my colliders. That's of course detail depend on detailed uh, uh, properties of my models. Again, uh, the decay chain is um, uh, very typically seen in SUSE inspired uh, uh, models, where we have a lot of states uh, near the TV scale and the weak scale. Okay. Okay. So. Things can be more and more complex, and uh, you can have asymmetric, asymmetric decay chains. You can have a mixture of onshore, uh, offshore particles, mixture of visible or semi-visible particles, etc. Many of them. Okay, but uh, but uh, but this kind of a production consideration already covers the you know a, a big class of B uh, the majority class of BSM searches we typically think about at colliders. Okay, so. Any questions about the topologies of BSM particles? Or well, some of your favorite one is not covered, you can, you can complain. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. In fact, there's many of those have standard model correspondence. Uh, but now, after thinking about all those topologies, let me, let's work out the first example, okay. the BSM resonance search. Uh, the so-called uh, topology one. People simply said uh, BSM search uh, resonance, S channel resonance. Okay. So I, I wrote simply here because. The first paper I've ever written is that uh, that was actually just turned on. As the, uh, the title is the simplest topology, uh, simplest uh, topology and largest rate as channel resonance. So there's another feature associated with that. Uh, but but I also want to mention uh, this seemingly simplest topology actually have many features that are more complex than the other topologies. Uh, if I have time, I'll be able to cover that. But let's uh, let's begin working on it. Let's start to postulate a BSM particle. Uh, what's your favorite BSM particle? That can be, huh? SAP. SAP is a pair production. Let's don't do that yet. Good, you know. Good, you know. It, with our priority, is also a pair produced uh, particle. Uh, he, he, wow, we are all Susie. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly I have much more hope now. <laughs> Robin came before you. Yeah, yeah. Huh? You know, Tom prepared the answer I wanted. So I, <laughs> if you open the notes I uploaded, I choose uh, Z prime. <laughs> so I, I will follow my notes, okay? Let's uh, write the Z prime. Super symmetric particle, we all love them. Uh, you, will, <laughs> you will come in. The, I, I, in particular, like the R-priority conserving case, which I will do them in pairs. So that, that's, that's not uh, this, okay? So. Again, Z prime can do many, have many different ways to couple to standard model. So I just let me just write a random version. Okay, have uh, uh, Q bar Q uh, Z prime plus L bar uh, uh, gamma mu L Z prime. Okay, they have their own mass. Uh, uh, it can come from a high, uh, you know higher gauge symmetry after spontaneous broken. It, in fact, I can have many different types of couplings, vector, axial vector couplings, a couple left-handed and right-handed, so many varieties. But let me be simple, because this is uh, a schematic, okay? So what's the major production mode for this Z prime? For the interaction like, is like this. Exactly, I, there's a quark doublet, so I have quarks. Uh, in particular, if you think about it, uh, it uh, would be one valence quark and dominant if I think about a heavy Z prime. Right? So the search is uh, Q bar Q, uh, 
some of uh, all the flavors, if, you know, if I make it flavor universal theory, okay? And the Z will decay. How many decay modes this Z prime boson have? Six, right? Flavor universal theory uh, and, uh, uh, oh, no, 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 six, sorry. <laughs> uh, 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 no, I'm confused, but uh, uh, 12, 12, 12, okay. Each of them is a double it, there are three generations. These are double it, three generations, so 12. Uh, well, but what, which channel I should look for? Yes, uh, the, the leptons, right? So Z will decay to quarks, which are jets. I have a huge background. And Z will decay to leptons. Uh, uh, of course, neutrinos, but I wouldn't search for neutrinos here. Uh, I would look for the charged lepton decays. So let me treat electrons and muons as, as clean as each other. So I'll write the L plus L minus, right? Okay. Uh, uh, of course, let me write a coupling here. And uh, GQ and uh, GL. Okay. Good. So this... We are learned, we are, we are ready to discover this Z prime, right? Because we find the best uh, search channel already. So what should we look for? We look for the invariant mass of the dilepton system. MLL, dilepton system. In reality, we'll search. We look for a pair of leptons. Because of magnetic field, we can see their charges. So we look for a same flavor, opposite uh, charge. Upper, opposite sign dilepton systems uh, in my data, right? So I look for them. The differential cross section from a standard model on this process as a function of the energy. Let me write down it in TeV. Okay. Okay. So let me write three TeV, uh, two TeV, one TeV, point one TeV. Okay. Okay. So what I will see in the standard model? Our standard model will give me a prediction. Actually, have a bump here. That is a Z boson pole. Z boson gave me this. And then have a smoothly falling function. Okay. This is my standard model background. Okay. This is a Z bump. In fact, I have many bumps here from standard model mesons. Triple Psi gave me that and many other particles, upsilons, et cetera. Right? So this standard model process is mediated by the background, mediated by the uh, Z boson and offshell Z boson, offshell photon. Okay? But this is, a, this, is a log, this is a logarithmic scale. Okay? So this is a fastly falling function. We know what drives this fast falling, right? What drives it? Why this function falls really fast? Right, That's, there's a PDF suppression of high power as a function of energy, right? To produce this amount of minimal dilepton invariant mass, this amount of dilepton invariant mass, my S hat have to be bigger or equal to MLL squared, right? So as I go to higher mass, I have a higher S hat, lower PDF. There's a big suppression here. On top of that, we of course know in a standard model process of QQ bar to LL through the offshore Z and offshore gamma, what is this cross section? When I'm far away from the Z pole, I'm automatically far away from the uh, gamma pole, the cross section, partonic cross section, is proportional to 1 over S hat. Okay? That's uh, dimensionally correct, and there's no other scales in the system, so it's clearly this. So there's a cross section, uh, one or S hat suppression plus a PDF suppression of S hat to the, you know, energy to the five to six power, or S hat roughly to the third power suppression, okay, from PDF, okay. So how would my Z prime appear in this process? There's a bump, right? Just as we, you learn. I'm seeing many images. You see a, 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 a you see a, a a bump that we find Higgs, right? I might have a bump. The height of the bump is proportional to the coupling product squared because I know the cross section of my 
my the, the amplitude of my z prime process is proportional to g q squared and g l squared times s hat u r by s hat minus m z prime squared plus i gamma z prime m z prime. Sorry for those who cannot see it, but this is uh, the propagator, you know. There's the corresponding uh, the S hat in there, you know, just forming contraction of the fermions. Okay? So that's my pro pro sorry, proportionality of my uh, fermions and my amplitude. So if I, if I square this, I will get a bump, right? So it's actually related to the definition of the Z prime mass. Uh, the mass is the, the pole in the scattering process. Question. Um, I think you kind of briefly mentioned this already, yeah. but um, using the PDFs, can you know exactly which quarks are most likely to participate in the interaction? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Let me repeat. You're asking, since I know PDF, uh, from my observed uh, event, do I know which quark participated in the interaction? The leading other answer is I wouldn't, right? Because I cannot see those quarks. Uh, uh, however, however, Given that I know, if you recall PDF, different particles have different, uh, different distributions. Okay? Uh, from different initial state, they have different luminosity, but they also have a different characteristic imbalance between X1 and X2. Right? If, I com if I combine the uh, valence quark to a glue, the, it's typically imbalanced towards the valence quark part because its PDF uh, prefers higher X, right? And they have different slope. So in fact, I would learn a bit about what's a, if I find any excess from its uh, rapidity distribution, uh, which I haven't defined, but I defined in my notes. <laughs> uh, we'll be able to infer a little bit about the, what's a, what's a, what's a uh, matter particle. There's many other tricks. For instance, I can ask, can you give me a, you know, uh, give me additional Z boson or W boson in, the, in this uh, initial state? Because different quarks have different charges uh, under, uh, under Z, uh, uh, Z and W, or different initial state. So by, after I discover this gauge boson, I can look for the next, next uh, uh, the lower cross-section uh, process with associated production with other particles that will help me diagnose, diagnose, uh, uh, diagnosis of the, uh, of the what, where was the initial state particle. There are many tricks one can do. It's all, there's all physics behind them, but uh, uh, let's uh, focus on discovery first, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, um, so basically, I square this amplitude, I will find this bump, right? So uh, I can try to make a measurement. I see data. I, 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 you know, I make uh, measurement, have fluctuations, et cetera. So here, I present a conservative future. That is, we haven't seen this uh, uh, Z prime, right? Uh, that's a typical uh, uh, baseline assumption we make uh, when we make projections. We always assume we observe a standard model. Uh, uh, when we project, the, the, uh, when we try to work out the projected sensitivities, but you are totally allowed to be optimistic and project a different one. Question. So when you do this kind of search, do you know the mass of the particle you're looking for ahead of time? Uh, I don't. Uh, so I really look for the whole scale that I can search for. That's why I say colliders covering a broad range of scales. So. So I don't know what's the Z prime mass I'm looking for. I don't know what's the Z prime coupling strength I'm looking for. So there's, there's a next step after I think this is the best channel to look for. I look for this in this channel. And there's the next step of translation into my model parameters. Yeah, I guess yeah. maybe I would be concerned about like a Lebel square effect. Like if you're just looking for some random bump in your data, uh -huh. of course you're going to get fluctuations. So how do you distinguish? Uh, in a moment. <laughs> yeah, I will show that. OK, uh, question. So maybe this is, um, so this is for the on-shell production of my Z prime. Yeah. Um, but I can also look at the off-shell case where it doesn't reconstruct the mass. Uh -huh. Can I ever hope to untangle that from the standard model background? Uh, there's a hole, uh, but it's also upcoming. <laughs> so we will show that the, later on. But the, let's talk about the simplest uh, step that I'm looking for a bump, trying to find this new particle. 
just like I've discovered how I discovered the Higgs boson. Okay? So I look for this, try really hard. I will try to derive, I, I observe the data, I will try to translate that data. Translate this data to some physics knowledge on my model parameters. Okay? So a typical plot you see for such kind of a search would be as a function of the z prime mass, say I label here, I'm looking for uh, uh, dilepton resonances. So let, let me call it a dilepton, a pair of lepton resonance result. So not only we discover Higgs in this class, classroom, we derive new limits on z prime today. Okay. So we put a limit on the model parameters, a typical model parameter we, we, we constrain on. Uh, actually, we try to make a model a bit model independent. We constrain this so-called z prime cross section divided by this branching fraction of z prime to the lepton. Okay, because clearly this depends on the how I design the z prime couplings, how it coupled to quarks, how strong it coupled to leptons. Depend on the ratio between those couplings, I may have different branching fraction, different probability to decay to the leptons when I produce the z prime. Okay, okay, and uh, I derive, uh, uh, I will try to derive a limit on this, okay? So, so how do I de derive limits? I believe you've seen several statistical treatment already, right? So we basically say my, my signal shouldn't be uh, generated, uh, shouldn't be large, shouldn't give me more than what I observe plus two times a fluctuation of, uh, or the two times the uncertainty of my data. This is so-called two sigma exclusion, okay? So observe data has uncertainty. I require my signal uh, uh, to be no more, no more than what I observe, subtract the standard model background expectation plus two times the uncertainty in my data. Okay. So what I, will have, what I will typically draw is a dashed line here. This so-called expected uncertainties, expected uh, exclusion lines. What, what does expected mean? This means if I make a measurement of this dilepton system, every data point I measure follows the standard model central value. So all the data points uh, you know, fall on this curve. Uh, uh, I, because I haven't conducted experiment yet when I'm trying to expect something. So I can derive a limit. This is an expected limit on the size of the cross section as a function of the prime mass. Okay, I can, I can move the peak here and here and change the strength of the cross section, make a peak, uh, the bump bigger or smaller. So I can, I can scan those and get a, get a result. Okay, question. Right, before making measurement, we actually know how to assign error bar. In fact, that's a very common practice. You have to understand all the uncertainty sources of your system before you open the data and derive a limit. This is called blind analysis. So what are the sources of the contribution to these uncertainties? There's the unavoidable source of statistical uncertainty. I measure number 10, I know from Poisson statistics it can go up and down, right? There's uncertainty from uh, how precise I can calculate the rate of the standard model process. So standard model curve itself have uncertainty. My beam luminosity, I told you about instantaneous luminosity, but that's in flat trees at a percent level. So, that number is also changing. My detector response to the dilepton states, I don't see every lepton I produce. That has uncertainty. So there's all sorts of uncertainties. People carefully study them and glue them together. They ha you have expected uncertainty of your, your data. And uh, assuming data follows the model curve, you will be able to derive this expected limit. So is that ultimately the best possible? Uh, no, that's not the best uh, we can have. That's the expected result we, 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 uh, we, we come up with from this given analysis for this given procedure. Maybe I'm smarter later, right? I do a machine learning and get a better signal background separation. I can make this lower. And also, if I have more data, I'm sure the statistical uncertainty will reduce. If I, continuous, uh, I continue not to observe this uh, bump, I will put a better limit to be a lower. So the lower means 
uh, more stringent constraint on the cross section means a better limit, right? I'm sensitive to a smaller couple. Okay, even a simple schematic curve already have a lot of physics behind that. This is purely like we are following standard model even, and we haven't opened data yet. But now we make a measurement like those. We will translate the data. Okay, okay, data fluctuates. So my observed limit fluctuates, okay? So my observed limit, maybe I have a bump here, I have a deficit here, so my observed limit, you know, oscillates around the expected limit because data fluctuates. You, you, are, you are anticipating a, a, a bunch of up and downs uh, in this. Okay, question? Uh, uh, okay, uh, good. I, there's one thing I want to talk about. That uh, good question. Uh, um, I guess is there a specialized, different technical analysis that you do when the width is very high? Uh, yeah, the, 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 there there is there is. But uh, remind me of that question when I talk about interference. After I talk about interference. Okay, question. Um, I'm surprised there isn't enough data that these oscillations smooth out. Uh, you are expecting them smooth out. You I are not. Uh, because there's so much data. Uh, 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 very good. Uh, but uh, be be before I do that, let me do another practice. Uh, maybe that will answer your question. Okay. So before I open my data, I draw this expected exclusion curve. I will need to draw two other curves. Uh, the two other curves are typically is a two other end. Typically, we feel the color uh, yellow and the green uh, happen to coincide with uh, the the national lag uh, uh, color of uh, Brazil. We call it the Brazil plot sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So we will see a, a, a band have all very, quite similar shape as curvature as this uh, expected exclusion limit, okay? This is the one sigma band of the expected limit. Because even without opening data, we anticipate data to fluctuate. If the data fluctuates at the one sigma level, the, our limit will change. So that's the band of one sigma uh, expected uh, solution. Okay. There's another band filled with an, I forgot, probably green color. That, that is the two sigma band. Okay. So I want to emphasize this one sigma and two sigma bands are totally our expectation, right? So we. We haven't seen data yet. We assume we have detector performance, of course. We assume we measure data follows the model by expectation, and hence his is not there. We'll be able to put the constraint on this. But data itself fluctuates. I know that. So if the data fluctuates at the one sigma level, I will be able to derive this inner band. Two sigma level, I'll be able to derive this outer band. Then I open the data. Okay. So at every search, blind analysis has this curve before they open the data. So then when I, op then I open the data, I will see uh, this time uh, various fluctuations uh, like this, OK? So this answers your question, I hope, right? Because I'm already, from statistical point of view, expect my uncertainty to be fluctuating around this band. So I observe some up and downs is totally expected. So with ultra high statistical precision, assuming I don't have big source of systematic uncertainty, the band will be narrower, and my observed limits will be fluctuating around them. In that sense, it's most out. Okay, but here's what we open data and we'll see. So the the brown line is oh, the yellow line. Uh, the brown line. Brown line is the observed limit for this uh, resonance that Lepon translated into the cross-section of Z prime times its branching fraction, okay? What does this mean? This means if I have a model who produced the Z prime times its branching fraction to a pair of leptons, that gave me a rate higher than this, than this line, this brown line, is excluded, disallowed at two sigma level by data. So anything above this line produce a higher signal rate than this line are excluded because I don't see such a bump of that size. But if the bump is smaller, my, it's totally within my data uncertainty, of course they are allowed. So below this line, they're still allowed, but we hope to continue to do research 
with new data coming in, we will improve the sensitivity, narrow the band, pushing the, uh, the, uh, the limits to a lower value, we'll be able to probe the new physics at the lower, lower value. Okay, I hope, I hope this is very helpful for you because most of you see those busy plots, you don't know how to interpret them, right? So this tells you what's going on, okay? Of course, I built in uh, access in this search. I built in a few access, right? This, uh, this small bumps above this two sigma aspect uh, value. So this, there is the two sigma access here, right? There's another two point something sigma access. This one probably is the three sigma access. So today in class, we have three access to, <laughs> to worry about, right? Okay, so, uh, but, but we could be in a different situation. That's related to a question uh, one of you asked earlier. Okay. What if I'm always look for a bump uh, that is narrow, so I can do my slide myself step by step, do many steps, so I can make many measurements. I can bend them very narrow. Okay. So there, I would be able to do uh, divide data more like more finely. So my limit would be. Uh, observed limit with the data fluctuation will look like look like look like this this uh, this yellow curve. Many more wiggles because I try to resolve more small narrower bumps. When I look for narrower bumps, I less background right. So I can I can I can try to. Uh, mm, try to improve my uh, search sensitivity, et cetera, uh, uh, but if I'm allowed to resolve that to be a narrow one, narrow one. But what determines how narrow, how broad I'm looking? There are two effects. Uh, two effects determines the broadness, okay? One is, of course, the width of my underlying resonance. If the Z prime is a broad resonance, I would expect a land shape that is a fat, right? If Z prime is narrow, I would expect a Brad Wigner, uh, this land shape to be uh, a narrow-ish one, okay? okay? So the width itself determines from my underlying theory, defines how narrow peak I should be looking at, okay? But on top of that, there is another effect called energy resolution. Uh, they actually use sigma, but let me use delta E, okay? And the resolution of the leptons. So even if my lepton has, for instance, have one TeV energy for means two TeV uh, Z prime decay, uh, I don't marry it to be one TeV. I may marry it to be 900 GeV, 10% resolution. resolution. So, uh, so every, there's a Gaussian spread of my, uh, my actual married, uh, 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 my married energy with respect to its truthful energy, right? So hence the reconstructed invariant mass peak of the dilaton system will be subject to this Gaussian spread of the my energy resolution. And in reality, it's not a Gaussian spread. It's actually a complex function. Our experimentalist can do a very detailed simulation of the detector response. But the energy resolution effect also broadens my peak. So these two effects added together determines how broad I can look for that. In fact, uh, uh, often we are in a case the width is much narrower than the energy resolution. So typically, we are bounded by the energy resolution of the system. Okay? Okay? Good. So now you should ask the question. Here, for the yellow ones compared to these uh, uh, brown ones, I have so many wiggles because I looked for so many different places. I can look for narrow and narrow peak. I look for so many places. Okay, independent search and data fluctuation, uh, you know, uh, uh, give you statistics. I'm expecting to see more accesses, because more searches, like more, uh, 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 like, uh, like more, doing more experiments, allowing uh, more rare events to, to appear, assuming they are all equally, uh, like, uh, uh, equally following standard model, okay? So the probability for you to see a two sigma access or three sigma access differs compared to the, to the brown curve. So you have to normalize this probability, okay? You, you want to compare in a fair way, whether I really see a three sigma access or not, okay? So this uh, access that we see here are all called the local significance. 
this means if I specifically look for this location of the invariant mass of the system, I, given this data set, I find such access compared to my expectation. Question? Uh, just make sure I'm following. So yeah. you're more likely to see an excess when you have broader bands? Uh, when I have narrower bands, which means I effectively look for did more, I look at the data more times and more, uh, 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 did more independent uh, experiments separately, okay? So, which means I have more places to look, look at, look, look at to uh, see an access, okay? Uh, I guess just to follow up, um, yeah. if, if you're looking in broader energy bands, wouldn't you uh, be more likely to capture sort of that full bit? Uh, uh, yes, yes. So if I look at, that, that's a, a good question. Uh, but so, so no matter I'm narrow or big, right? Why don't I just look for a big band uh, of data, right? So yes, you can. However, when I look for a big band of data, I'm not optimizing my search. With a big band of data, I have to take care of the integrated area of this as my background. Uh, but my signal only populates the narrow or central part. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not uh, using the data in a maximal way, right? So instead, if I know what I'm looking is in such a narrow region, I should really shrink my, my resonance search to that narrow region. So I reduce the number of background I have to take into account. So even such a simple resonance search, there, there's a, a lot of consideration I have to put in uh, to derive this. Okay? But so far, we see several local access. Okay? So we need to translate local significance to a global significance, the word you also have heard before. Okay? That is uh, trying to take into account that when I look for narrower resonances, so when I look for many different places, I'm expected to see certain uh, uh, accesses. Okay? So the local significance is translating to global significance. And their relation is to the global significance is always uh, smaller than local significance. In fact, uh, the relation roughly can be understood as global significance is local significance divided by root n. Root n means the number of uh, independent uh, bumps I'm trying to hunt in this process. Okay? Okay? So, simple resonance search. Okay? That's the plot you typically see uh, uh, when you look for BSM. It's, uh, it's, uh, the, the, this uh, uh, resonance BSM particle has the largest phase space because one more say, particle, I, I reduce my phase space. In terms of coupling counting, typically there's a more coupling suppression for the other processes as well. So many, whenever I can do a BSM uh, resonance search, I will do that. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, it, this is uh, this is the first uh, topology in its simplest form. Okay. okay. Any questions about this? Yeah. So LSE to say high luminosity LSE. Uh -huh. uh, your statistics get better in your error band strength. That's right. What would you need to do to bring down the expected curve? Ah, so uh, very good. So let's let's uh, let's discuss what drives this band. What what set up this? Okay. So uh, I hope I can explain that in the proper way. Uh, let's see. Observe number of events. Number of events. Let me, let me talk about the expected curve, okay? Observe number of events equals the standard model, that's what I'm assuming, times the integrated luminosity of, of my collection of data. So that's how many events I'm observing. The uncertainty, statistical uncertainty associated with that in the large statistical limit is the root of this, right? My upper limit, two sigma, uh, okay, two sigma, upper limit on my signal cross-section, signal uh, Z prime, let's call that, times BR. Okay. Times the integrated luminosity, that's how many events I'm expecting to observe for my Z prime signal. Should be smaller than you know, uh, 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 the uncertainty of my observed data. Recall, my requirement is I, my new physics do not produce more than what I observe within the two sigma tolerance. So the two sigma tolerance is two times delta observed. 
Okay? Because I know what the math back background is. Unlike many other experiments where the background are out of control, at the LHC or other collider experiment, for most of the time, the background are under control because we contrast that against the hypothesis of standard model. So we can subtract the standard model background, only subject to the uncertainty of that. So which is this, right? So now, uh, let me finish that uh, question, okay? So now you know what's my limit. My limit, I try to constrain, is th this quantity, right? As I collect more data, which means I have a higher luminosity, this bound will be, if I, I should divide both sides by L, just to put, uh, put the things uh, into the quantity I want to constrain. As I go to higher, higher luminosity, I have, I, my limit will decrease as one of root L. So more luminosity means more data, means uh, 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 um, smaller relative uncertainty of my data fluctuation compared to their central value. Okay? And that allows me to reduce my uh, 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 expected uh, upper limit on the cross section by scaling like this. So this is still just narrowing the band, right? It's not bringing down uh, No, this is a rich. The band, the uncertainty of the band is uh, uncertainty of this quantity, okay? The, there's another, there's one more layer of uncertainty, which you can view it as the fluctuations of backgrounds, uh, the, the, the fluctuation. <laughs> it's just like a, uh, the, the analysis of the uncertainties of uncertainties. So this band is the uncertainties of uncertainties, okay? To derive, to derive this, I only need the uncertainty of the background itself, okay? Okay, so what's going to shrink with higher luminosity, my upper limit on the uh, signal uh, cross-section time branching will just go down, okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why is the observed, just total observed number, should that not be plus the stuff sigma z prime times branching ratio z prime plus L O? Uh, should this not be added on to the observed? Ah, very good. So the question is, uh, wh why my observed uh, number of events uh, should, uh, doesn't equal to sigma b standard model plus sigma b as m times l? Okay. So we are doing hypothesis testing. Uh, there's a there's a different contrast. We are uh, contrast against the non hypothesis of the standard model only. So so here I'm assuming I'm observing standard model. So I write it this way. Uh, after class we can talk about the detailed definition of discovery and exclusion limit. There's some tricky business there, but uh, I want to give you the basic information uh, in this class due to time, okay? Um, so now, uh, I was expecting one question, but I want to explain to you, but uh, I didn't. That is, uh, why did I draw, why did I draw my expected uh, as, uh, exclusion like this? Like a smile face, right? <laughs> okay, there's a physics behind that. Think about it. I'm trying to constrain the signal times, uh, 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 signal cross-section time branching fraction. I'm trying really subject to the uncertainty of my, uh, you know, standard model background, bin by bin, one environment mass uh, uh, window by another environment mass window. The reason my constraint is worse here on the left-hand side, simply because, simply because my standard model background there is larger. So the statistical uh, 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 fluctuation of there is larger. So I should expect a worse uncertainty in there. So my constraints are worse, okay? Why do I expect the constraints on this end to be worse? Anyone guess? Too heavy to produce. Too heavy to produce. Uh, 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 and that I haven't translated to theory yet, but here, this is on cross-section, right? Too high to produce means the cross-section would go to zero, for a given coupling. But here I'm binding cross section, I have it uh, itself. So it, it doesn't know it's hard to produce that yet. Okay? So why this goes up? Hmm? Uh, it is low data, but if I have no data in this bin, I should be able to, let's say, I have no data here. Okay? I didn't observe anything. I still should be able to put the constraint on the cross section. Right? No data means uh, at two sigma level. Poisson statistics means I shouldn't have more than three signal events produced. Okay? And I would put a constraint on the cross section itself. It's supposed to be a flat line. Okay? But it goes up 
because, because the standard model background prediction and also the, the, uh, is becoming uncertain. This region are typically dominated by standard model theory uncertainties, mainly coming from pattern distribution functions. I never tell you about pattern distribution function itself have uncertainty, but you should expect so, because we extract them from data. We are lack of data, in particular, in the large X region where I have very few events, and we also have large uncertainty in the low X region uh, that you wouldn't see here, because that's extremely low X, okay? So, because I don't know what standard model rate well, so I don't know how much standard model background I should subtract, that leads to my, uh, you know, this part need to fold in the PDF uncertainties of my processes, et cetera, that gave me a, typically a worse constraint. Okay, question. I just have a general question about yeah. uh, this type of search. Um, yeah. So I always hear about the Lagoco effect, but I don't yeah. actually know what it is. Ah, so that's what I just explained, uh, okay. the global significance. Local, I see so many because I did so many experiments, so I need to account for that, okay? okay. So I need to, so I translate local to global. This is really trying to account for the Luca elsewhere effect. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so, so we see a typical, typical curve for this, uh, this uh, simple resonance search. Okay. Um, there's something else I want to talk about, but I, I don't have time. I just want to mention that, okay? Uh, um, um, Clearly, clearly, uh, uh, I, I think I have time. I have to talk about it. So, uh, so let me talk about it. I cannot skip that the important topic. Uh, so, so, so clearly, when I try to say I'm looking for a bump here, I'm doing things in a very rough way. Okay. It's not even QFT consistent, quantum mechanics consistent, right? Because we, we have the same initial state, QQ bar, microscopically in the hard cross-section. Standard model gave me Z or gamma. I have to interfere their, these diagrams, right? This will give me left time plus, left time minus. I inject a new signal, that is QQ bar going to Z prime, going to L plus, L minus, okay? How can I make the assumption that this piece and this piece, they don't interfere with each other. They don't see each other. That's a totally un not a valid assumption, but terrible assumption, right? Okay, quantum mechanically, they should interfere. Okay, so when I say I can subtract the background and constrain the signal like this, I'm making a lot of assumptions. Okay, I will just mention the few assumptions we are making here, just give you a flavor of what, what's going on. But uh, there's a detailed proof of uh, um, uh, narrow weights approximation, and it's uh, what that effect uh, ignores uh, in, my, in my notes. Uh, you, you can look at it. I actually proved that uh, for, uh, for arbitrary number of final states, uh, which uh, I haven't seen in other places, uh, can be useful, okay? So, so what I should do is to interfere both pieces, okay? Let me write down schematically what's the standard model amplitude will look like. Ampere standard model will be simply, okay, uh, schematically, I times G, uh, you know, those interact, I just combine them together, okay? I, because I'm looking at the invariant mass much higher than the uh, Z mass or uh, photon is massless. Is, so in the massless limit, I can ignore everything. I will just write it as G squared over S hat, okay? That's my standard model amplitude. Okay, let me ignore I also. My BSM amplitude, I wrote down already. That is a GQ, GL, times S hat, divided by S hat, times Z squared, times Z prime. Okay? Okay? I should interfere this to amplitude. Okay? So what I should observe, my new physics, so, What's my BSM contribution to my dilepton invariant mass cross section? Should it be standard model plus BSM squared, right? Minus standard model squared. 
uh, you can time same phase space and uh, flux factor, so it doesn't matter. Right? This is what my new phase uh, would give me. Okay? This is what standard model would give me. The difference is my new phase contribution. Okay? Okay? So obviously, this difference includes three components, two components. I have standard model squared of this piece minus standard model squared, so I, I get rid of that. Right? So I have BSM squared. Okay? And I have two times the real of M standard model times M BSM star. That's my truthful, honest to God, quantum mechanical observed uh, new physics compared to my standard model, right? Okay, so what's this piece? This is a BSM squared. That's this bump that we typically take into account, okay? The bump size, the area under the bump in the narrow region with flat uh, PDF, it can be factorized as a signal cross-section time branching fraction. This process is called the narrow width approximation. So we made a narrow width approximation. Even when I try to write down my signal, it's like cross-section times BR. There's an uncertainty, there's a small error I'm making with that due to this approximation. But, but that's the thing we do when we, when we think about things this way. That's what we did for Higgs. That's what we did for Z, for other, many other particles. Okay? Okay? So this piece, signal squared, and the narrow width approximation is contribution, which is the area under this curve, equals cross-section times branching fraction. Okay? Evaluate at, at, at its pole. So this is piece is called the Brad Wigner resonance. Okay? I showed the, the proof of how to convert Brad Wigner resonance to narrow width, through, narrow width approximation to this in, in my notes. But let's take it, some of you may have seen it. Okay? But this piece is quantum mechanical. Okay? In the world we care about quantum physics, we shouldn't drop this. Right? So let's take a look at what this piece is. Okay? Because that's related to another question was asked earlier. Okay? So let's look at it. Let's see if I have room. Uh, I don't. I think I can erase this part of the board. I just want to stay on the same side of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the classroom so you can see all the resonances in, in one, on one side. Okay. 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 So, two times the real of I'm standard model times I'm, I'm BSM. Okay. Okay. So, equals, I wrote down their amplitude uh, here. <laughs> amplitude here. Right? So, the real part of this times the real part of this, or imaginary part of this times the imaginary part of this. Right? So, that's. Uh, that's what I would do. With a small rearrangement, I will find it to be the real part of G squared, GQ, GL, uh, uh, 1 over S hat times the real part of S hat times S hat minus MZ prime squared plus I gamma Z. Plus the imaginary part, actually minus, because I imaginary part of g squared gq gl times 1 over s hat times imaginary part of s hat okay. Okay. So very easy to understand. This is the function. This is a function as a, uh, you know, with a pole parameter and also a function of the central mass, collision central mass energy. Sorry, I'm over time. Uh, okay. Um, uh, that gave you quite interesting behaviors that's written in the note. 
the other way. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me draw the picture, that's right, okay? This piece is highly non-trivial, but we often, uh, we often forget about it because the, this piece is often zero at the tree level, okay? But this piece, clearly, this piece is an, uh, is a root s hat divided by mz prime times root s hat plus mz prime divided by uh, s hat minus mz prime squared plus gamma squared mz prime squared. Okay, so this is the real part. The behavior of the piece around the pole, mz prime, is like the following. Below it is negative, above it is positive, so it's a, it's a function like this, okay? The typical peak is at gamma z prime over two, okay? So this piece is always there. I typically, I cannot drop this piece, okay? Okay, in quantum mechanics, uh, I cannot change the law of quantum mechanics. Then why in my search for Higgs boson, I search for z prime, I drop this? Because I integrate over this range when I, make, uh, when I try to look for a, a window broader than a width. And this is clearly a symmetric function by good approximation that they don't contribute to the rate. So I drop the interference term because it doesn't contribute to the rate when I cannot resolve uh, the width, okay? And uh, there, are more, <laughs> there are much more to say about actually we use this to look for, to bound the Higgs width because this make a shift of the pole in the, the peak location of the peak. And also there's a non-decoupling effect uh, at uh, low invariant mass, which we call it interference. That's how we do EFT searches and try to bound the new physics from precision without seeing the pole, which was one of the questions asked earlier. Okay, so uh, the topic is very exciting. We got many questions, uh, we see in detail how we conduct resonance search. So let me conclude uh, today's uh, lecture by saying, uh, uh, essentially, when we do BSM searches, we want, to do, we want to do bump hunting as much as possible, right? So whenever we can re reconstruct the BSM physics when they decay back to standard model, we look for the bump, okay? Pair of bumps, three bumps, we just look for bumps, okay? We can, when we have a missing energy, we do tricks trying to re restore the bumps. We use the so-called transverse mass for singly produced particle, a standard model plus invisible. If I had to pair production with a pair of invisible particles, we use a variable called mt2, et cetera, to reconstruct the bump. So we do bump hunting for a good reason, and even bump hunting has a lot of detailed physics we should understand, okay? There's many extended material, uh, interesting extensions, and what we can do for BSM searches, that's in my notes. Uh, I hope uh, you have time to take a look at them, and also I welcome any questions afterwards. Thanks. Yeah. Uh,